Hello and welcome to today's lesson where we're going to be looking at simple harmonic motion graphs. So in today's lesson we're going to try and understand and interpret simple harmonic motion graphs. So we're going to try to use graphs to describe the characteristics of simple harmonic motion, explain the conditions needed for simple harmonic motion and use the equations for simple harmonic motion. And this falls into the AQA A level physics specification for the periodic motion topic which is part of paper 1 on the A-level, but not found on AS Physics. So we're going to be looking at the following part of the specification, and in particular, we're going to be looking at the ideas of the graphical representations linking the variations of x, displacement, v, velocity, and a, acceleration with time, and have an appreciation of how the different graphs can be derived from each other, and then hopefully sketch the relationships between x, v, a, and t, for simple harmonic oscillators. So in a previous lesson we considered the concept of simple harmonic motion and we said that the conditions for simple harmonic motion are the following. Condition 1. The acceleration experienced by an oscillator is proportional to the displacement of the oscillator from its equilibrium position but this acceleration must be acting in the opposite direction to the displacement so toward the equilibrium point which gives us an equation for acceleration is equal to minus omega squared x where it's implied that acceleration is directly proportional to x from the equation but also it's in opposite directions because you've got that negative term in there. Now we can use these conditions to derive graphical interpretations of oscillations which take place in simple harmonic motion. So let us consider the motion of a pendulum, a simple harmonic oscillator in one complete cycle. So when it, a pendulum is released from point A, okay, we know we're at maximum displacement, so the bob will accelerate and move towards the centre point because that's the equilibrium position. So here at this point we've got maximum displacement from the equilibrium, we're at the amplitude, so the force will have to be a maximum and so the acceleration will have to be a maximum. We know this because acceleration is directly proportional to displacement and force is directly proportional to acceleration. But at that particular instance, because we have the uh, maximum value there, the actual velocity is at zero because at that point it stopped instantaneously moving and is going to be swinging back towards equilibrium. Now always remember though, the force and the acceleration, whilst they're both, ma both maximums, will be acting in the opposite direction to displacement due to the condition of simple harmonic motion. Once we get to point B, at equilibrium position, if, it was at, if there was no uh, motion going on at this particular point, your oscillator would rest here, so it's at equilibrium. So at this point, the displacement of the equilibrium is at zero. The force is at zero, because force and displacement are directly proportional, and also acceleration is as well. But at that particular point, the velocity will be at its maximum for the particular journey. At point C, again, we've got a maximum displacement, a maximum force, a maximum acceleration, and at, at that instantaneous point of C, the velocity is zero because we're at our maximum displacement, so we can't travel any further. But as a result, remember as well that even though the velocity is at zero, the acceleration's at a maximum, but it's in the opposite direction to displacement because it wants to act back towards the equilibrium position. Now again, point D, we've got our displacement as zero, our force is zero, our acceleration is zero, but our velocity is a maximum. Now just to, be, just to clarify here, if this body was already in motion, even though there's no force on the object, the object will still have inertia, which is from the Newton's first law, which says that if there is no resultant force on an object, an object will continue with the same speed and direction, so we'll continue to move past the equilibrium position back to point E again, which is where we started our cycle. So we can actually graph this cycle with a displacement against time graph. So this is the, the graph you would achieve. So you had point A, point B, point C, point D, point E, which is the start of the new cycle, so it's the same position as point A. Now, just to clarify, you can start the displacement as either positive or negative, depending on your preference. So unless it's stated in the situation, you can decide whether the displacement is a positive or whether the displacement is a negative. 
So let's just assume that the displacement in this particular cycle started as a negative. It then went to equilibrium, so it was at zero. It then went to the maximum positive displacement, which was C, back to equilibrium again at D, and then back to our maximum negative displacement at E. So we've got our maximum displacements and our minimum displacements. Now just remember as well that obviously a maximum displacement can either be a maximum positive or a maximum negative. It just indicates the direction it is from the equilibrium point. So you've got those particular concepts there. Now we can actually graph the velocity due to simple harmonic motion with time as well. And I can try with my very best to draw these diagrams in sync with each other because they represent the same oscillator. So as we are aware that you've got a minimum velocity at the start, a zero, you then got a maximum velocity, then a minimum, then a maximum, then a minimum, then a maximum, then a minimum, then a maximum again. Now remember, the maximum velocity occurs at the equilibrium point, so when your displacement is zero, but your minimum velocity occurs in maximum displacement. So the graphs line up like this. So you'll see that they're actually shifted one from each other. So whilst one is a sine graph, which is the velocity, the other is a cos graph, which is the displacement. But you'll notice that when you've got maximum velocity, you've got minimum displacement, and vice versa. Now, we can also graph the acceleration due to a simple harmonic motion with time and an oscillation. Now, remember, because acceleration and displacement are directly proportional to each other, that means that actually they will have the same shape curve. However, the difference is that acceleration and displacement must be acting in opposite directions. That's condition two of simple harmonic motion. So whilst you've got a negative displacement at the start, you've got a positive acceleration and vice versa. So in this particular instance, because we started with a negative displacement, we're going to start with a positive acceleration. If we decided to start our displacement as a positive, we will be starting with a negative acceleration. So whilst they have the same shape, they're actually opposite ways of your x-axis because when one is positive, the other is negative, and vice versa. So we can denote our areas of maximum and minimum accelerations as following. So you've got your maximum acceleration to start with, then your minimum acceleration, then your maximum, then your minimum, then your maximum, then your minimum, then your maximum again. So remember, our maximum acceleration occurs in maximum displacement, whilst our minimum acceleration occurs at the equilibrium point of the cycle. So we can link all three graphs next to each other. So you'll notice that the um, displacement and acceleration graphs are the same except that they're flipped in terms of positive and negatives because acceleration and displacement act in opposite directions to each other whilst the, the velocity time graph is shifted uh, by a quarter of a cycle away from each other so one is a sine and one is a cos curve so we can actually go a little bit beyond the specification to understand where this comes from. So we've stated previously that the, the, the displacement equation is x equals a cos omega t. Now this is a little bit of A-level mathematics. Now you don't need to be aware of this for your A-level physics, but you might like to see the link between A-level physics and A-level maths if you do both courses. So here we can say that the velocity time graph is what we call the first differential of the displacement time graph whilst the acceleration time graph is the second differential of the displacement time graph or the first differential of the velocity time graph. Now differential or differentiate just means to divide a value by the quantity of time. So the first differential means I will divide the original value by time. So for example we've taken our displacement time graph divided it by time and we've got a velocity time graph which makes sense because displacement divided by time equals velocity and then if we took our velocity and divided that by time we we'll get acceleration which is why the, the acceleration time graph is the differential of the velocity time graph. Now we can use the rules of differentiation to work out the equation for the velocity time graph. Now can I just say again you do not need to be aware of how to do this or even know what the equation is for A-level physics but again for those who do A-level mathematics it might be a nice link between the two subjects so you can see the link between physics and maths. So the rule is, again, this is just A-level math, this is not needed for A-level physics, is the differential of cos or cosine 
is minus sign. So when you differentiate or divide by time for cos, you will get minus sign. Now in addition, the term in the brackets comes to the outside when differentiation takes place. So this gives us the following equation for velocity in simple harmonic motion. So the differential of displacement, which is velocity, because displacement divided by time is velocity, is equal to a minus sine omega omega t. So where does that come from? Well, that comes from the fact that because the omega is being multiplied by the time in the original equation, it's brought outside of the brackets. So we can then use this to work out the differential, uh, the equation for the acceleration time graph. So the rule is that the differential of minus sine is minus cosine. So when we differentiate minus sine, we get minus cos. So we do this again. Now, so our differential of velocity or our second differential of displacement is going to be equal to minus omega squared a cos omega t. Now, where is that second omega come from? Because, again, it was multiplied by the time in the brackets before we differentiated, so it pops to the outside, and then our sign turns to a cos. Now, the reason why I've done this, the reason why I wanted to show you this, as well as showing you the link between physics and mathematics, is that if you look at the equation, what we've worked out is the equation that we looked at previously, which is the condition of simple harmonic motion. Because we know from our first equation, which is x equals a cos omega t, that at a cos omega t is actually in the equation. So that can just simplify to x. So now we can say a is equal to minus omega squared x. So as a result, we've got the equation which links it into um, simple harmonic motion and it indicates that what we knew before acceleration is directly proportional to displacement but in the opposite direction because we've got a negative sign so this shows you how mathematics can actually prove the physics behind these particular concepts now again just to clarify that was not that is not on the a level physics specification but you might like to see the synoptic link with a level maths so, by the way, just to note that d squared over, d over dt squared is the d notation for second differential or divided by time twice. So we're proving there that we've got simple harmonic motion. Now, we can use the condition for acceleration, which is a equals minus omega squared x, to find the restoring force in simple harmonic motion. Now remember, the restoring force always acts towards the equilibrium position. It's always trying to get the oscillator to return back the equilibrium position. So we can combine Newton's second law with our equation for simple harmonic motion acceleration because we know F equals MA. So what we can do is place an M in front of the equation for acceleration and then we get our equation for the restoring force. Now please note that the restoring force is always a negative. Why is it always a negative? Because it's always trying to get back towards equilibrium. So it's always opposing the motion on the object. So our restoring force equals F equals minus M omega squared x and we can assume this is simple harmonic motion is an application of Newton's laws of motion so it's just an application of what you've learned previously now this equation does not have to be memorized because it can be found in the equation book but it always acts to restore the oscillator back to the equilibrium position but at the equilibrium position because it's no longer displaced from the equilibrium position it's back to where it wants to be the restoring force is zero but if the oscillator was already in motion it was already carrying out movement it will move past the equilibrium position even though there's no restoring force acting upon it because it will have inertia because at the equilibrium position the moving oscillator will continue to move with the same velocity past the equilibrium position which is where we get our motion of a cycle from. So remember it's the simple harmonic motion is the combination of both the restoring force and inertia. Similar to how circular motion is the combination of the centripetal force and inertia. So always remember the concept of inertia. So hopefully if we've learned in this particular lesson and we understand simple harmonic motion we can remember our equations from our previous lesson, including the condition for simple harmonic motion, and we can understand and sketch graphical representations linking the variations of 
of x, v, and a with time, and appreciate that vt graphs is derived from the gradient of an xt graph, which is shown by a differential, and that at graphs is derived from the gradient of the vt graph, again, which is shown by a differential. I hope you've enjoyed today's lesson, and you can use graphs to describe the characteristics of simple harmonic motion. You know the conditions needed for simple harmonic motion, and you can use the equations for simple harmonic motion. So have a lovely day, and I hope you've learned, you've learned a lot in today's lesson, and you've enjoyed looking at the graphs of simple harmonic motion.